welcome back uh, to all of you uh, with, you know the participants and, and welcome to all of the all of you who have uh, joined us during the course of the panel discussion uh, um, and as you know this is what this is the finance that we are running um, in the context uh, in in some sense as a, as a as a celebration but also in place of the conference india finance conference that should have normally been held at this point in time in fact today was supposed to be a, in the normal course of things would have been the first inaugural day of the conference um anyway without much ado i let me get straight into the thing i'm actually i'm extremely happy to introduce to you uh, professor robert webb bob webb who probably needs very little introduction he's a prof and he, uh, he's a professor of finance at the university of virginia but is uh, but i don't know on one people in the finance academy and know all of him, about him as the editor of the journal of futures markets one of the major finance and uh, futures markets journals uh, across the world uh, bob has uh, you know specializes in and in speculative sorry of speculative markets uh, looking at with particular emphasis on how differences in market structure uh, affect the behavior of the market prices uh, and and also how traders make decisions and how noise affects the markets he has a very wide range of research interests which include high frequency trading on financial markets latency and behavioral finance as i said the professor webb is an editor of the journal of futures market um and uh, which is the leading academic journal focusing on derivative securities and markets he's also authored a number of few books a number of books trading catalysts how events move markets and create trading opportunities in 2007 and macroeconomic information and financial trading uh in 1994 he's also been a co-author of the book star shock markets trading lessons for volatile times uh, published by uh, ft press in 2013 his is is published very widely across all top journals journal of econometrics journal of business economics and business and economic statistics journal of futures markets amongst others bob also is a prolific writer in the popular press writing for the wall street journal the nikkei weekly the investor week business daily mk news economic newspaper the nihon kaizai shimbun amongst others interestingly uh, professor webb has also worked outside of outside of academia he's been a consultant uh, which he's been he's traded fixed income securities for the world bank as a consultant he's been the member of the chicago mercantile exchange trading futures and options uh, on the, he's he's designed financial futures and options contracts for the chicago mercantile exchange as a senior financial and uh, economist and has also served as a senior financial economist at the executive office of the president office of the budget office of management and budget at the us commodity futures trading corporation commission our uh, behavior he, he, he has he, and not just in the us has worked across the world in various regulatory aspects and has worked with various regulators he's also been a consultant on top risk management issue on risk management issues critical risk management issues to the asian development bank Bob serves as a visiting professor at the Darden Graduate School of Business and Administration at the University of Virginia, and and has held a joint appointment with KAIST, uh, with, uh, which is the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology Business School, between 2009 and 2012. Uh, Bob has uh, a PhD from Chicago, an MBA and a PhD from Chicago. Prior to which he did his uh, he got his uh, you know BBA in Business Administration from the University of Wisconsin at Eau Claire. uh bob is going to talk today about risk capital and risk appetite and i think in this environment that we are in uh this is a very very critical thing to talk about about risk and risk capital um and also the ability to take risks which is basically uh, you know manifested in terms of the risk appetite with that and without further ado let me hand it over to bob uh professor robert webb bob the floor is yours uh we could go up to about let's say about 50 odd minutes 50 55 minutes and then we can have about you know 5 to 10 minutes of q&a okay sounds great well uh thank you sarkin uh and shan for those very kind comments uh, uh it's my pleasure to be here uh during your afternoon and my morning uh, to talk to you about risk capital and risk appetite and to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the india finance association uh, uh during uh, finance day 2020 so uh looks like a just uh, need to change my screen again you have to share it again uh, okay. okay great 
Okay, so what I want to talk about is something both topical and, and, and also uh, longstanding, and that's the notion of risk capital and risk appetite. And I want to talk about it in the context of what has happened this year, uh, not only in the States, but also around the world in, in terms of the impact of the COVID-19. But I'll, I'll emphasize uh, the, the impact on U.S. financial markets uh, of the uh, pandemic and, and, and then uh, the subsequent lockdown as well. You know, and so taking us back to February of this year, the, uh, the U.S. equity market had reached an all-time high uh, in uh, mid to, to late February. Yeah, and then suddenly there began a sell-off, okay? And, and what we witnessed was a combination of both a liquidity crash in the U.S. financial markets in late February and March, and a reaction uh, into the partial lockdown of the U.S. economy and the potential impact and feared impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, as you might expect, uh, there were predictable flights to safety as investors uh, you know, uh, shed their risky assets in favor of safe havens. Um, however, as we'll talk about later, some of the safe havens, the traditional safe havens such as gold, or some of the new safe havens such as Bitcoin, uh, proved to be less so. And that was even more so for U.S. Treasuries as well. Yeah, and so what we saw in late February and March was this brutal sell-off in, 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 in equities, but we even saw more of one in terms of the fixed income market. Now, here's a, a graphic uh, taken from Bloomberg, uh, which uh, shows the S&P 500 uh, stock index. And you can see, you know, kind of this, you know, uh, sharp decline really from the previous peak, you know, in, in uh, uh, late February of 2020. Uh, sell off, a little bit of a recovery, a, a further sell off, and a further sell off, et cetera. Now, one of the things about an environment like this is that when we recovered from this you know, sell off, which totaled around 34% in less than a month, uh, it almost seems like yeah, the recovery was preordained when in fact it really wasn't. Okay? What we had here was you know, uh, really a, a near death experience, so to speak. I, I remember my wife, uh, asking me uh, what, what assets do we have that are safe? And I had to give her the unfortunate answer, none, that nothing was safe during this you know, particular environment. And as you can see right here in this uh, subsequent chart, you know, we then uh, saw the, uh, the uh, S&P bounce back. Yeah, since it had fallen by 34%, it had to rise by at least 50% in order just to uh, break even. But it uh, rose beyond that, you know, and uh, yesterday it closed at 37, um, 22.48 in, in terms of the S&P. You, know? you know, so we had uh, uh, this 34% sell off by, you know, late August, we had recovered all the losses and then some, the 55% gain. Uh, and, uh, and, and of course, we've moved further higher since then. Uh, but you know, for anyone watching markets during this time period, this is you know, really has been a, uh, a, a very scary time period to, to, to be in financial markets. Now, of course, both the NASDAQ uh, Composite Index and the Russell 2000, with the latter being a very broad measure of uh, smaller stocks, uh, fell in February and in, in, in March as well. And, and so here we see the NASDAQ and, and the extent of the decline. And of course, the even larger rebound in terms of the NASDAQ, which is a very tech heavy uh, index. Uh, here's the Russell 2000, and again, uh, you know, kind of a sharp decline in February and in, in March, you know, and then a, a re recovery as well since then. Uh, and as I said a moment ago, um, you know, we, we saw investors flee. Uh, you know, equity for supposed safe havens. You know, uh, gold was one of those. Bitcoin was another one. You know, Bitcoin much ballyhooed as a digital gold. Well, you know, while both have performed well since yeah, 
uh, the, the crash. If you look at the, the, the gold futures contract and you look at what happened during you know, you know, the time period where there's an equity sell-off, there's also a sell-off in gold. Okay? And again, um, you know, that sell-off might be forgotten in, in terms of the subsequent rally in, in, in gold prices. And something is similar in terms of Bitcoin, where Bitcoin, rather than being something that protected you when you most needed it, did not protect you. It also fell in value. Now, again, a Bitcoin, much of the news, you know, selling for over $21,000 per, per coin. But at that point in time, you know, when you needed it as a hedge, it did not serve as one. But I want to focus a little bit more on the fixed income market, which and the fixed income market is oftentimes uh, ignored, especially in the uh, popular press, where the attention is primarily on the equity market. And the fixed income market really was devastated. And we saw this even in, in terms of U.S. Treasuries, you know, where we, there was a, a huge rally you know, as investors fled stocks for the safety of Treasuries, a sharp break a subsequent rally, another break, another rally. And we can see this in terms of the behavior of the 10-year U.S. Treasury note futures price, as well as in terms of the price of U.S. Treasury bond index, ETF. You know, so just to kind of, you know, get you the sense of the time, you know, so in late February, you know, the equity market starts to fall. Here's our predictable rally in terms of, of uh, a flight to safety in terms of U.S. Treasuries. And here's the unpredictable part of it, the de sharp decline in the price of treasuries, a little bit of a rally back up, followed by a sharp decline, yeah, uh, before the sell-off was um, really was over. And again, this is a period of time where you know, nothing seemed to be safe. Uh, here's a graphic also from Bloomberg uh, of the uh, the former Lehman Bond Index, now called the Bloomberg Barclays Treasury Bond Index. And, and again, you get a better sense in terms of what's happening to this uh, kind of ETF. Again, uh, not surprisingly, it's mirroring the 10-year Treasury note, futures contract, uh, a rally in, in the ETF followed by a break, uh, a rally, and then another sharp break before rallying again. You know, yeah, as all of you know, the, the backbone of the fixed income market in, in uh, the U.S. is really you know, the market of U.S. Treasury securities. It's a huge market, uh, in part because uh, we have a large uh, you know, uh, amount of debt, which has to be you know, continually refinanced as well. And of course, the focus in the, in the U.S. Treasury markets is on the on-the-run U.S. Treasury securities. The on-the-run uh, U.S. Treasury securities are the most recently issued Treasury security in each maturity class. You know, the uh, three-month Treasury bill, the six-month Treasury bill, the one-year Treasury note, the two-year Treasury note, you know, the five-year Treasury note, the 10-year Treasury note, and the 30-year Treasury bond. And if you looked at, uh, you know, kind of the yield spread between, you know, uh, let, let's say the kind of the lowest investment grade uh, bond, you know, you know, the Moody's double A bond, and the U.S. Treasury uh, note, the ten-year note, you know that spread not surprisingly rose and it rose sharply. It more than doubled, you know, in, in a period of less than a month, from two point zero five percent to four point three one percent. And again, what I want to point out is, is that we have both a liquidity crash and rational reasons for selling stuff. You know this, you know. Uh, decline in, in, in financial markets, you know, and if you look at the uh, the bond market, you can get a better sense in terms of the nature of this liquidity crash when you look at individual corporate bonds, you know, and, and so if you look at the, um, you know, you look at the 30-year 2.4 percent, you know, Apple Inc. bonds, you know, um, you know the uh, McDonald's Corporation medium investment grade bonds are 3.6% coupon, uh, you know, uh, yeah, and we'll, we'll see in just a moment when I show some graphics and kind of the extent of the decline in, in each of these uh, as well. Now, these bonds differ in terms of duration, you know, but, you know, these are tremendous moves in short periods of time for investment grade corporate debt, you know, and again, the picture 
tells uh, a thousand words, so to, speak, so to speak, here, you know, where here's the Apple 30 year, um, 2.4% coupon bond. Okay. And again, you know, this is one of the largest companies in the world in terms of market capitalization. Yeah, and the bond is being priced, you know, initially as a safe haven, you know, hence this rally, you know, but within a, a couple of weeks, you know, is being priced as if it's, you know, yeah, there's a high probability it could go into default. You know, the same thing is true really for the McDonald's 10 year, you know, 3.6% you know, coupon bond. Uh, again, these bonds, Differ in duration and hence sensitivity, but you can see, you know, that this is more than just a, a really kind of a, a traditional sell-off. You know, this is a liquidity crash, and and here's the Disney, you know, you know, twenty-nine year, you know, and two and three quarter percent coupon bond. Yeah, you know, and it's uh, plotted against kind of this little uh, the the index, uh, you know, that I mentioned previously. You know, the, the Bloomberg Barclays in, 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 in index. Again, you see this very sharp sell-off. And, and, and this is what I'm talking about in terms of a, a liquidity crash, okay? Not merely that you had a sell-off, you know, but in you know, the magnitude of the sell-off, okay? And of course, if we looked elsewhere in, in terms of the financial market during this time period, uh, we would see, uh, you know, you know sell-off in, in other sectors. And this can be shown by looking at some of the uh, ETFs, you, got, you know, muni bonds, you know, pr prices fell, municipal bonds, uh, intermediate corporate bond prices fell, junk bond prices fell, real estate prices fell. You know, and so the MUB is a e uh, exchange traded fund, which is a proxy for the muni bond sector. And again, you can see this kind of sharp, sharp sell-off, you know, that, that, that occurred during this time period versus, you know, you know, what would happen <clears throat> during other <clears throat> periods in the uh, more recent past. <clears throat> uh, similarly, if you, know, if you look at, uh, <clears throat> you know, a, a proxy you know, for the uh, intermediate term corporate bond sector, and you get a similar, you know, kind of sharp sell-off, kind of indicative of, uh, you know, of a liquidity crash. And, and of course, you know, the sector where you, you aren't surprised to see a sharp sell-off is the high yield bond sector, the junk bond sector. But again, the extent of the sell-off you know, is perhaps sharper than what one might expect. Uh, now here's the, an ETF that is a proxy for the real estate sector. And you know, not only is there a sharp sell-off, but the subsequent rally and, uh, is not as pronounced, and probably for a good reason, as you can see, uh, you know, what could be a, uh, a long-term shift away from in-person shopping to doing more online shopping, you know, and a decline in, in terms of commercial real estate, you know, for uh, selling items, as well as for workers needing to, to work in, in offices as opposed to working remotely. Now, as with all things, almost invariably there are forewarnings, you know, and liquidity crashes have, have occurred in, in, in the past. Uh, there were forewarnings of what might happen <clears throat> during the flash crash in US stocks <clears throat> on May 6 of 2010. <clears throat> but there's also a flash rally in US Treasury securities on 15 October 2014 where the 10-year U.S. Treasury note fell 15, uh, 16 basis points rather, then rose 16 basis points in a 12-minute period. What are the 37 basis point to range during one trading day? Now, those are massive changes in, in, in Treasury bill yields. And there was a report that the Treasury Department in the U.S. conducted trying to investigate what caused you know, this flash rally in, in Treasury note prices, or flash crash in, in, in treasury yields. And, and I think it's instructive to kind of look at this uh, you know, figure 2.5, and these are reproduced from the, the staff report, you know, um, because you can see right there that the, this action on October 15th is one of the largest moves, you know, intraday moves ever 
in, in you know, uh, the 10 year treasury market. And of course, this first chart shows you the, the extent of how rapid this you know, uh, price move was. And as we see in a lot of areas of, in terms of finance, there's not a good explanation for it. We don't know why it occurred. Yeah, you know, there was a, the report, you know, said that, you know, for such significant volatility and a large round trip in prices to occur in so short a time when no obvious catalyst is unprecedented in the recent history of the U.S. Treasury market, unquote. And that's taken from this joint staff report. All of which leads us into, you know, the discussion I want to focus on, which is risk capital and risk appetite. And one of the things we've seen over the last several years has been the uh, uh, increase in the importance of high frequency trading in, in many markets around the world. Okay? And this dominance of high frequency trading uh, has had both benefits and you know, uh, some potential problems as well, you know, or at least it has exacerbated potential for problems. And, and one reason for this is, is that much of the high frequency trading that occurs contrary maybe to the popular imagination is really market making. And uh, Lars Norden at, at the Stockholm Bjorn, uh, um, Hank Strummer also at Stockholm, uh, published paper in the other JFM, the Journal of Financial Markets, uh, uh, entitled the Diversity of High Frequency Traders. And they, and they found that m most of the trading that was occurring by high frequency traders was market making. And if you're a market maker, you wanna be avoid you want to avoid being picked off. You want to avoid these sniping costs. And high frequency trading firms are very good at avoiding sniping costs. You know, and so the question then arises, what lessons can we draw from past liquidity crashes under different market structures before the rise of high frequency trading? Well, this is where this experience that, uh, um, you know, Sankarshan was talking about yeah, you know, when, when he introduced me, it comes into play. And I had the good fortune of working for the uh, World Bank, you know, for the investment department of the World Bank. Yeah. And the investment department of the World Bank <clears throat> managed at that time a portfolio between 19 to $22 billion, depending on whether you counted uh, IFC, International Finance Corporation, and IDA funds or, uh, or not. And about two thirds was invested in US dollar to non dated securities. And it was actively traded. And we had direct lines with every uh, primary government security dealer, you know, that, that was in operation at the time. And there were over 40 of them um, at that time when I was there back in 87 to 88. And these the primary government security dealers were the dominant financial firms of the day. And, and they were trading large amounts in the US treasury market as was their obligation. Yeah, and during the cra uh, stock market crash on 19 October 1987, I happened to be trading fixed income securities for the World Bank. Now, I recognize that I'm fairly senior, yeah, and a lot of you weren't even alive during 1987. Or if you were, you're too young to kind of remember it. But that was a day where U.S. stock uh, prices fell 23%. Uh, the S&P 500 stock index futures fell 29% that day. And it was devastating to watch because the cause of the crash was unknown at the time and remains unknown today. And one little known fact that I'd like to point out is that uh, during that day of the crash, 19 October, when the stock market was open, the U.S. Treasury long bond, the 30-year Treasury bond, also fell in price that day. Now, after the market had closed down, you know, 23%, you know, or 508 points in terms of the Dow Jones Duster average, there was this massive flight to safety, you know, and investors wanted to you know, invest in U.S. Treasuries and near Treasury securities. The prices rose sharply. It was you know, going to be the largest one-day move ever in U.S. Treasuries. Um, you know, so when I came to work uh, at the World Bank on, on the 20th of October 1987, the day after the crash, the Treasury bond futures market in Chicago was lock limit up. 
you know, simply put, the t Treasury bond futures market was closed, you know, uh, um, to, you know, at that point in time. Now, as I said a moment ago, the World Bank uh, traded with virtually every primary government security dealer at the time. And as you might expect, there were rumors swirling around all of them, yeah, you know, uh, and especially around several prominent investment banks in terms of whether they were solvent. And on that Tuesday, 20 of October, 1987, none, absolutely none of the 40 plus primary government security dealers would make a market in US treasury securities on a principal basis or the World Bank. Some would make a market on an agency basis. You know, that is if they could you know, find a buyer if we want to sell or you know, find a seller if we wanted to buy, uh, they would try to do so, but they wouldn't. Uh, act as a market maker. And the question then arises, why? And I can tell you why it wasn't, okay? It wasn't fear uh, of the security being traded, you know, you know, because the U.S. Treasury securities are default free. It wasn't because U.S. Treasury securities were declining that day in value. Rather, we had the largest one day rally ever in U.S. Treasury securities. It wasn't fear of counterpart party risk, um, you know, because the World Bank is backed by, you know, all the member countries. Indeed, you know, if you're talking about counterparty risk, the, the fear was that the, I was on the World Bank side, you know, would the uh, investment banks that we would be trading with, um, would they be able to honor their obligations? And so the question that arises, why wouldn't any of the 40 plus primary government security dealers make it market for the World Bank on Tuesday, 20 October, 1987, during the you know, biggest one day rally ever in US Treasury securities. And the answer is, is simply you know, that the, the US Treasury futures market was closed. They couldn't lay off their risk in the Treasury bond futures market. Now that highlights the importance of the futures market, you know, but, yeah, you know, think about it a little bit more deeply, you know, because uh, as was also stated in the introduction, you know, by Sankerson, um, I also traded on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. I was one of the locals trading on the floor. Now, our rival exchange, the Chicago Board of Trade, traded, you know, U.S. Treasury features, you know, but, you know, the, the fact is, is that some of the most heavily capitalized commercial and investment banks in the world at that time who were trading, you know, U.S. Treasury uh, securities on, um, would not do so on a principal basis on a day where they could not lay off their interest rate risk in the futures market. Okay, so who's on the other side? You know, so if the Treasury bond futures markets were open, who would they be laying off their interest rate risk to? Well, it would be the locals, okay? The comparatively thinly capitalized local traders, people trading on the floor like I used to do, okay? You know, so when you think about it, you had the largest capital market in the world at the time, depending upon floor traders on the Chicago Board of Trade to absorb price risk. And if the Chicago Board of Trade didn't open up the cash treasury market wouldn't open either. Now, I should also add that, you know, that, that when we think back to uh, uh, the, you know, the 19th and 20th of October, 1987, it wasn't clear you know, on the morning of the 20th the, of October, 1987, whether the US financial markets would survive. Okay? We had you know, um, basically what looked like a financial meltdown. And, and that's why I said a moment ago that what happened earlier this year was, you know, in one sense, kind of a near-death experience as well. You know, so um, it looked like the U.S. stock market had further to fall that morning. Uh, the dominant stock index futures market, you know, at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the S&P 500 stock index futures market, suspended trading in response to requests by the U.S. Federal Reserve during late morning. The Chicago Board Options Exchange, which trades equity options, suspended um, equity options trading as well. Uh, the Chicago Board of Trade though, yeah, did not respond to the request by the Federal Reserve. 
and they traded a, 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 a competing stock index futures contract. And that the market remained open. And that was significant in part because there was an inexplicable rally in this thinly traded major market index. And this index was designed to mirror the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Okay? Uh, it had 20 stocks rather than 30 stocks. Um, you know, but the uh, principal family that ran the uh, Dow Jones uh, at, at company at the time, the Man Bancroft fa family, didn't want to have uh, the Wall Street Journal, uh, I'm sorry, didn't want to have the, the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average uh, uh, name associated with a futures contract. You know, and so they refused a couple million dollars a year that had been offered them by the Chicago Board of Trade to allow them to license that name. But that index, that major market index, uh, um, you know, had a huge rally all of a sudden. And that rally was led by trading by locals. You know, so you know, if you look at it in a different sort of way, um, thinly capitalized locals turned the stock market around. You know, after the crash of October 1987 as well. You know, and so once again, comparatively thinly capitalized locals on the floor of the derivatives exchanges in Chicago played an outside role in financial markets. Now, the pits are gone or largely gone in the USA and, and, and they aren't coming back, okay? And high frequency tra traders have to come to dominate markets, uh, or, or come to dominate trading on markets, rather. Uh, and this changes, increased the sensitivity of financial markets, sudden changes in risk appetite and, and access to risk capital. And so if we were to fast forward to this year, 2020, um, you know, we, we, we saw this sharp decline, you know, in equity and, you know, prices during late February and most of March. Uh, we also saw this, you know, how the fixed income market was, was savaged you know, in, in the subsequent market melee and flights of safety uh, were not surprisingly uh, uh, safe. Okay. You know, as, you know, so we, we saw flights of safety, you know, but, you know, what was surprising that sometimes uh, uh, those flights of safety were, were not uh, satisfactory. So what stopped the carnage, okay? Was, were there any specifically well-capitalized banks who uh, could have taken up the, the slack? Yes, but they didn't, yeah? Rather, it was the U.S. Federal Reserve that stepped in. And to be sure, the, you know, the Fed's actions did not immediately stop the carnage in the financial markets. Indeed, the continuing carnage in the financial markets forced the Fed to make a series of uh, ever greater commitments to the market. And it wasn't until the Fed promised to be a backstop for much of the fixed income market, including many junk bonds and municipals, that the carnage stopped and the recovery began. Now, the Fed's intervention has really been mixed. You know, it, it purchased around a trillion dollars of mortgage-backed securities, but very little junk bonds or muni debt. You know, and so, um, it's interesting to kind of note, you know, that the, in other sectors of the market, the Fed really didn't have to buy very many securities to impact the market. Yeah, it merely had to announce that it was going to be a backstop. Yeah. Yeah. So once it promised to kind of step in the market when needed, that was sufficient, at least so far. Yeah. You know, however, this raises a, a different sort of question in terms of, you know, should the central bank... Uh, really be the buyer of last resorts for all sorts of dodgy credit. Yeah. Yeah. And we know that this distorts incentives, you know, and distorts prices as, as, as well. Yeah. And we also know that at some point during a future crisis, the Fed may have to actually buy uh, dodgy paper in large quantities. You know, and we also know that having the Fed or any central bank act as a buyer last resort is at best a temporary solution. And we need to kind of address some of the problems in the current market microstructure uh, if future liquidity crashes are to be averted. And uh, particular attention needs to be to, you know, directed to changing the structure of the US Treasury market. 
And, and so there uh, what was a paper uh, by Antoine Bouveret and, and, and others, and they argue that, quote, changes in the structure of the U.S. Treasury market in recent years may have increased risk to financial stability. Traditional market makers have changed their liquidity provision by increasingly switching from risk warehousing to risk distribution, and a new breed of market maker has emerged with the rise of electronic trading. The flash crash of October 15, 2014 provides a clear example of how such risk can materialize. And uh, you know, the authors then go on to argue, quote, based on in-depth analysis of the event, you know, complementing uh, authorities' work, we suggest providing incentives for liquidity provision, improving market safeguards, and enhancing regulation of treasury markets. Now, those are some good suggestions, but it's not clear that they really are sufficient. For example, it's not clear that incentivizing liquidity provision is sufficient as a record of the firms most likely be incentivized is questionable. You know? And again, think back to the old market structure and think back to the example I gave of the stock market crash in 1987. Presumably all of the primary government security dealers were incentivized to make markets under this old market structure. You know, they didn't do so when they're needed most. Yeah? They didn't make a market in you know, the largest one day ever treasury bond market rally. Now, other scholars have proposed other policy actions. Yeah, and there's a paper by Terry Marsh and others that proposed you know, a, a bulk uh, um, you know, uh, volume synchronized probability informed trading uh, futures contract to monitor you know, and manage the risk of liquidity crashes. And so this is an interesting suggestion you know, and uh, Terry Marsh was one of my classmates at, at, at Chicago when, when I was there. Yeah, and so his, his paper go, goes on to argue, um, quote, we, we find that a rise in the VPIN effectively foreshadows high levels of volatility in the indexes of several countries. If a, um, you know, <clears throat> a bulk volume yeah, well, uh, VPIN futures contract yeah, could yeah, would exist, we show that it would uh, exhibit safe haven characteristics during market downturns. In particular, a simple active portfolio um, you know, strategy that uh, times you know, in, in investments uh, in equities, uh, risk-free assets uh, with, with VPIN levels are low, outperforms a buy and hold strategy. Yeah. And so effectively, they, they, uh, um, you know, they, they go on to argue that this uh, BV, VPIN futures contract could be a, a useful tool for, you know, both risk monitoring and, and for managing, um, you know, uh, portfolio risk for portfolio managers and regulators. Now, having also worked as senior financial economist at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, you know, where my job was to design new financial futures and option contracts, it's a little bit difficult to accept that this might work, you know, because first off, you have to ask yourself, who would be the natural participants in this market during tranquil times? Who would be the natural participants during uh, um, you know, times of stress you know, as well? You know, it's also you know, kind of difficult to accept that this, you know, this uh, approach because it really suggests, you know, and, and this is, quite honestly, due in part to uh, uh, Maureen O'Hare, et cetera, and uh, her husband, David Easley, you know, that, uh, you know, you can predict toxic order flow because it suggests a, a profitable trading strategy. Now, one thing we can say is that uh, to date, no derivatives, uh, you know, contracts have been introduced, you know, that have that um, proposed design. You know, and, and so, you know, this paper, as I was saying a moment ago, by, um, by Low Lee and Marsh, yeah, it really builds on, you know, an assertion you know, by David Easley and Maureen O'Hare and Jose Lopez de Prado that toxicity can be anticipated in advance via the use of VPIN, okay? Um, you yeah, know, and so this notion of order flow tox, uh, toxicity is very controversial, the, we have, a very heated debate between Anderson and Bondarenko and uh, Easley O'Hara 
and Lopez de Prado uh, really about this. Uh, there's kind of mixed evidence. I, I know, um, you know that the journal Future Markets has published, you know, uh, a study you know, showing, uh, you know, order flow toxicity. Um, but one of the problems, you know, that uh, um, I have with it is it does also suggest, you know, a profitable trading strategy. If indeed you can predict, you know, toxic order flow hours in advance, or even longer as, you know, easily um, O'Hara and Lopez de Prado suggest, you know, that is a very powerful, you know, um, a trading strategy that people somehow have not made um, or taken advantage of. Now, the other policy actions have also been suggested. Uh, Chespa and Foucault, uh, are you liquidity, quote, liquidity providers, uh, um, you know, obtain information about an asset from prices of other securities, you know, and they show the, a self-reinforcing positive relationship between price informatives and liquidity. Uh, this relationship causes liquidity spillovers and is a source of fragility. A small drop in the liquid asset can, through a feedback loop, result in a very large drop in liquidity and price informativeness, uh, a liquidity crash. This feedback loop provides a new explanation for co-movements and liquidity drives. It also uh, demonstrates the importance of dealing with uh, liquidity crashes. And in a provocative working paper you know, examining a number of liquidity crashes in French uh, stocks, Mario Belia and others argue, quote, high frequency traders do, do not play a beneficial role to market efficiency uh, during periods of pronounced market distress. Uh, this behavior differs from, from uh, from what they're usually doing in, in, during a tranquil market. Yeah. And, you know, they, they go on to uh, argue that non-HFTs who receive a compensation from buying at a discount uh, really are the individuals who support the recovery. Uh, put, put differently, Belia and others suggest that slow traders stop market crashes and start market recoveries. And indeed, this is similar to what I observed is happening during the stock market crash of October 1987 in the United States and the rally in treasury bonds that followed it. However, the best policy actions to take to prevent future severe liquidity crashes are unclear. What is clear is that liquidity crashes coupled with market sell-offs like what we observed in late February and you know, most of March in 2020 are likely to recur. And society may be more dependent on market participants who have relatively less risk capital but greater risk appetites you know, to stop liquidity crashes and spark market recoveries. Now, let me emphasize one last point. I'm not saying that every uh, thinly capitalized individual has a greater risk appetite uh, than, than large you know, financial organizations, but certainly some do. And with that, uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, thank you, Bob, uh, for a nice presentation and taking us through, you know, almost 33 years journey. And what you showed is that history repeats. So when people talk about, you know, estimating risk premium, and we debate most often in our class that whether we should use last 20 year data or last 100 years data, what is the trade-off between rigor and relevance? We say that, you know, history in financial markets repeats. And your example of what happened in 87 and 2020 kind of indicates that position. Uh, before I open it up to the floor, I have a question for you, which is, you know, during the COVID times, there is another phenomena which we are observing and the, the experts have started making comments is the apparent disconnect between the real sector and the financial markets. Where you know real estate sectors are devastated, excepting some technology-based sectors. But market is showing up not only in US, in almost every country, including our country. 
because you've worked in market, you have you closely look at it. So what do you think would be the possible reasons for this disconnect and why is stock market is so optimistic and the other markets are not? Oh, that is an excellent question, uh, Ashok. Uh, it's, uh, it is, it's difficult to say. I mean, uh, there was a uh, presentation by Cam Hardy um, months ago, you know, um, and I, I want to say it was in May um, of, of, of this year. And it was about what, what type of recovery will we have? Will it be a V-shaped recovery? Will it be, uh, um, you know, a, a depression uh, and, and followed by a slow recovery um, or, or something else? Yeah, and his argument uh, was basically that because it was a pandemic, it was probably a V-shaped And yeah, that uh, once the contagion had passed, and again, he uh, of course didn't um, predict how how much of a problem there'd be in the states. I, I don't want to say that he did, but I, I think that's a little bit of a part of it in in, in in sense that I think market participants are saying, well, yes, there will be sectors that are hard hit, and certainly the hospitality sector, the tourism sector happens to come to mind. Uh, on the downside and other sectors, as you pointed out, you know, the tech sector, which is, which has done very well. Uh, so I, I think part of it is, is that the, there's just the natural positioning of investors trying to anticipate the next price move. You know, and that causes, you know, uh, a little bit of a disconnect between what's happening in financial markets, as well as what's happening uh, in, in the real economy. Okay. Thanks. So let me open it up for questions from the floor. So if anyone, any participant would like to ask a question, you can unmute and, uh, you know, put your question. You can ask the question directly to Bob. Yeah. Okay, so Aparna is saying thank you. That's fine. So, uh, there's a question from Aparna. I'm reading it out. Bob, can you see that question? If you say that slow traders can prevent liquidity shocks as against high frequency traders, the fast traders, how do you explain the liquidity crisis in September 2019? Okay, so I think it's important to say that uh, slow traders may not you know, stop the liquidity shock but they can help, you know, speed the recovery from it. Okay? And so we can still have uh, situations where, um, you know, there, there's a liquidity uh, shock that, that, that happens, um, but how long that lasts, you know, may, may well be dependent upon the actions of slower traders as opposed to the organizations that we would normally think about. I, I think a different way of putting that is that it's natural for us to think in terms of, oh, what should a central bank do and who should a central bank uh, or government encourage to, to try to um, cause the uh, economy and, and financial markets to return to quote normal. And it would be natural to kind of focus on the large players, you know, you know the, the large financial organizations. Um, but it seems to, to be the case that oftentimes, you know, during certain financial crises, at least, those large players aren't there. You know? And instead, it's the slower traders who are, by their very nature, far less well capitalized, who, through their actions, are, are able to kind of turn things around. Uh, there is a clarificatory question uh, from Narahari is, what are those toxic orders? I mean, how do you identify toxic orders? Um, yeah, so, yeah, so toxic orders would be orders that the market makers, you know, um, yeah, don't really want to kind of process, okay? Now, this whole idea of order flow toxicity uh, and, and its predictability, uh, you know, kind of, goes back to the uh, this kind of studies by Easley and O'Hara, okay? And so 
Uh, as a former trader, I have some real problems with that for the reasons I mentioned during my talk. And that is that you know, if this order flow uh, toxicity can be, if toxic order flow can be predicted, which is what um, Easley and O'Hara and Lopez de Prado argue, and if it can be predicted you know, hours, if not days in advance, which is also a strange uh, kind of contention on their part, you know, then again, that suggests that there are huge unexploited profit opportunities. Yeah. But I, I would encourage people to take a look at the, uh, the papers by Easley, O'Hara, and Lopez de Prado in terms of their exact interpretation of toxic order flow you know, uh, as well. Thanks. See, uh, Bob, we did a study uh, looking at the behavior of HFTs, the speed traders in India, during periods of mini crisis, mini crash, not like COVID type. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that it is the HFTs who actually provide liquidity, not the slow traders. And the slow traders actually move away from the market whenever they see some abnormal volatility, not a huge crash. And uh, they hold on to their orders or liquidity for the market to kind of come to a, some kind of normalcy. But these guys, these high frequency traders, they don't shy away from the market. So maybe during deep crash, what you are saying, that is the slow guys who put, but in case of you know, some less than or more than normal volatility, it is the HFT who provide liquidity. Yeah, and I'm glad you raised that uh, point uh, because uh, uh, I don't want to give the wrong impression. I think most of the time, high frequency traders are providing liquidity to the marketplace. Most of the evidence in the academic literature su suggests that uh, high frequency trading adds liquidity without adding volatility. Yeah. You know, and so high frequency trading is a good thing. Uh, the real question is, is it, does that apply only during tranquil markets or does it also apply during you know, turbulent markets? You know, and, and the point that you just made is may, maybe how much turbulence is too much. You know? And I, I think you're, you're, you're correct there, you know, that we could have a fair amount of turbulence that could you know, deter you know, uh, slow traders you know, and, and high frequency traders continue to provide liquidity. The other point is, is that when we th look at slow traders, the fact that some slow traders, you know, will add liquidity, you know, will have the risk appetite doesn't mean that all do. You know, I would say that the vast bulk of, uh, of uh, retail traders in, in the States were, were scared, you know, not surprisingly during late February and March. Okay. You know? You know, um, you know, and so it's uh, it's a little bit like uh, you know the example of October 1987, uh, where the the locals on the floor were um, you, know, you know were providing liquidity, but probably not the man on the street uh, in, in Chicago, so to speak, would, would not be. Okay, you know, so a, a subsection. Uh, of, uh, you know, of slow traders would be the ones with the risk appetite, you know, um, to, uh, to buy during you know, periods of, um, you know, market sell-offs, et cetera. Yeah, so I just have a last question from my side as a follow-up, you know, okay. so how do you, in the U.S., do you get data from the market with the flag that no, this is the high frequency guy, or you use some proxy to identify HFT uh, order or HFT trades? Almost invariably, you have to use a proxy. The data exists, okay? You know, uh, and so several years ago, um, Andre uh, Kirilenko uh, was chief economist at the uh, U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission, uh, Matthew Barron, Princeton and Jonathan Brogard of Washington State University uh, had conducted a study on the profitability of high frequency traders. Now, the data that they had was CME data that's not available to the public, which identified you know, basically trader ID data. Okay, you know, um, and, and so 
uh, they, they had trader ID data. They were able to then uh, kind of hypothesize from, you know, you know, kind of the trading, monitoring who was a high frequency trader and who was not. Uh, so the general answer to your question is no, those data aren't available. Uh, do those data exist? They exist, but they're you know, really uh, um, not shared by exchanges except when exchanges have to, which is you know, the problem you know, when, which is how Kirilenko, uh, Barron and Brogard obtained their data and you know, from a CFTC request. Thanks. So we're almost coming to the end of this presentation. The last question uh, from Asif Amin, and his question is that this sharp fall that you have shown in the period of February, March, is it only because of COVID led shock or were there some other factors across asset class? Yeah, that's great. Well, so my, my contention is, is a combination. Okay, it's a combination of a natural reaction to COVID, you know, and, and, and the lockdown, you know, the potential lockdown of the U.S. economy, and a liquidity crash, okay? You know, and so when we look at flash crashes, like what happened, you know, on, on 6th of May, 2010, or, you know, the flash crash in yields, flash rally in, in bond prices on 15 October, 2014 in the treasury market, then you have a very short period of time of matter of minutes and you can say, this is just a liquidity crash. Uh, what we looked at in, in February and March is a combination, a combination of a liquidity crash mm -hmm. and you know, a natural reaction to you know, dimming economic prospects. You know, and I think you see it most clearly you know, in some of the uh, corporate bonds. You know, the, you know, it, think in terms of the example that I, I gave uh, a, a moment ago in terms of, you know, the Apple bond, you know, um, you know uh, or, or the Disney uh, bond, yeah. Yeah. Like, like here. Yeah, yeah and so is, is Disney really going to go under? Uh, probably not, okay? And so this is a, you know, again, a period of potential economic recession uh, you know, being faced, but you know, um, should bond prices decline as much as they did? Or, you know, you know, the you know, Apple, you know, is, is the largest company in, in the world or one of the largest companies in the world really going to default on its uh, bonds? Probably not. And so there you have a, you know, a combination, you know, a liquidity crash as well as reaction to, uh, um, you know, uh, de deteriorating economy. Right, so I think my colleague at India Finance Association, Ashok, is there. Ashok, over to you for the final words for this session. Let me check. Okay, so then uh, there is one more question, Bob. Yes. Last question is on the screen where this is from Aparna, who says that, do you think that traders may not participate during crashes that we were discussing because of some other reason? And she says it is because of internal risk management limits or regulatory limits. According to a Fed study, this is why many banks did not increase their lending in spite of money market rates spiking up in September, 2019. I, I think that's a good point. Um, yes, I think that if you're a trader working for a large organization, you may suddenly find you know, that uh, um, your you know, trading line has, has been diminished. Okay? You know, so you as a trader might say, now's the time to buy, but your organization might uh, limit what you can do. Okay? Uh, and so so that, can, that could also be a factor as well. Okay. So... Thank you, Bob. I know it's very early in the day for you, and uh, but we really enjoyed your presentation and your response to several questions. We also faced similar behavior in our Indian market in the month of February, March, and then rally. We saw a rally. Even now, the market is having a very strong rally. We saw some IPOs in India during the COVID times where the total volume is like 2016 level volume. So it is wow. a much pre-COVID volume. So 
something is going on the market people are bullish on the stock market whereas whereas there are gloom in other sectors so that's the worry many you know public policy makers have that is the market behaving in a different way but anyway i think it was a great presentation we really enjoyed thank you very much uh, for spending your time with us uh, well thank you for inviting me i i, I certainly enjoyed delivering it and, and enjoyed the uh, receiving and answering your questions as well. Thanks. Thanks. So friends, with this, uh, we end this technical session and uh, we'll have a small break. After that, the valedictory session where, you know, you know, there's a speaker from National Stock Exchange who is going to talk about the issues we are discussing that why the market is behaving in the way it is behaving, how the stock market is affected. So we have an expert from NSC and then some concluding remarks from us. That will happen this around 6.42 now. So we will take about eight minutes break and come back at 6.50. Let me check whether the speaker is already there. And yes, sir. Yes, sir. The speaker, Mr. Ravi Varanasi is online. Okay, fine. So we can yes, therefore start a little early also. Sure, sir. A couple of minutes. Okay, thank you, Bob. But if you want to listen, you may. You are most welcome to stay. Right? But it's up to you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So, Anusha, we'll start at. <laughs> 45. Yes, sir. Yes, I'll just ask Mr. Ravi Varansi uh, for a video check. Sir, could you please unmute and uh, come online, sir? Yeah, good evening. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Sir, are you going to share your screen for the presentation? I uh, know there's no presentation. I'll just speak. Okay, sure, sir. Your video is perfectly fine as well as your audio. Thank you, sir. So we'll begin around 6.45? Yeah, sure. Sure, sir. thank you, sir. Hi, Ravi. So we'll get back in two minutes. Sure, sure. So can we begin now, sir? Yeah, you can start. Sure, no problem. Okay, thank you, sir. Good evening. So here we are for the last session of this evening. The Center for Capital Markets and Risk Management of IIM Bangalore, in association with the National Stock Exchange of India's Investor Protection Fund Trust, launched the platform for investor education on 14th August 2020, which is a product neutral platform that aims to enhance financial literacy and enable investors in volatile times. 
the Center for Capital Markets and Risk Management has been a collaborator in organizing the Finance Day celebrations of 2020. And our speaker for the last session is Mr. Ravi Varanasi, the Chief Business Development Officer of the National Stock Exchange of India. Mr. Ravi Varanasi is an experienced professional in the field of financial markets and has been associated with the National Stock Exchange of India for more than 25 years now. We welcome you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Ravi Varanasi will be speaking on securities market under the impact of the global pandemic. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Anvesha. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my thanks to Indian Finance uh, Association for inviting me to this India Finance Conference uh, 2020. I'm sure you have uh, benefited from the discussion so far on a variety of important topics. In fact, I'm joined uh, towards halfway through uh, uh, Professor Robert Webb's uh, presentation. It was an interesting presentation. Obviously, lots of questions um, around uh, the market microstructure and how the market microstructure is getting impacted by the presence or absence of uh, so-called HFT uh, is, is a day-to-day -day, uh, uh, issue for us. Um, so it, it, it's quite interesting. Um, so we are living through unprecedented times, a live economic activity, businesses, and everything we consider normal has been completely upended. Demand has slumped across businesses and supply chains uh, have been disrupted with severe lockdowns across the globe. Uh, the unwinding is slow and sporadic uh, with continued infections in some parts of the world and second wave in others. Uh, we finally seem to be on the cusp of uh, return to normalcy with uh, different vaccine candidates uh, receiving approvals uh, in some parts of the world. And in other, others, we hope uh, those uh, approvals will, will happen in the near future. Hopefully we should see the vaccine rollout over the next uh, couple of months. Uh, and we'll cover 7.5 billion people across the globe, hopefully in 2021. Uh, governments across the world have intervened vigorously to keep the economies and businesses going. Uh, these in interventions have been fairly effective uh, so far. However, the big question is, um, can governments keep uh, these interventions going till normalcy completely returns? On economic front, uh, India continues to be one of the largest economies with significant growth prospect in the long term. India is uh, the fifth largest economy in the world, with close to $3 trillion GDP. Uh, despite the unprecedented uh, coronavirus pandemic and 60-day lockdown initially, a fairly strict one uh, compared to most other parts, the economy has, reco has uh, recovered pretty sharply in the second quarter. Um, once the restrictions have been eased. Um, there have been multiple institutions, in, including both, both RBI as well as international institutions, including IMF, uh, are projecting a significant um, turnaround uh, for Indian GDP growth, uh, anywhere between 8 to 20, uh, 8 to 10 percent in the financial year 22. Uh, and India is predicted to be one of the fastest fastest growing economies in 2022. So essentially, uh, we seem to be re really doing uh, reasonably, hopefully we'll do reasonably well as we go forward. The government has initiated several measures to achieve higher growth in the near term. India has uh, utilized coronavirus uh, crisis to bring in changes that would have long-term impact. Uh, the production linked incentive scheme uh, could result in a significant uh, improvement across sectors as diverse as uh, pharmaceuticals, automobiles, telecom, and food products. Uh, the government has uh, come out with uh, transformative measures in the giant um, agriculture sector, um, making it market friendly, globally competitive, and uh, raise the long term growth trajectory. There are significant expectations uh, from the the agricultural market reforms, which uh, which government has announced, uh, the implementation hopefully uh, uh, ha will happen in the near future. Uh, obviously, there are uh, some level of uh, issues which have come up, but um, uh, this possibly th these uh, ch set of changes which the government has brought in will transform the agricultural market for uh, agricultural produce and will build a, a, a fairly competitive 
internationally competitive um, supply chain right from the farm gate to to the markets so so there is a lot um, which is riding on these uh, reforms as we go forward ease of doing business ranking improved um, uh, uh, driving api uh, there is a consistent improvement in uh, uh, ease of doing business index Eight of uh, uh, eight out of ten uh, indicators have witnessed improvement over the last five years. The reason why India has been a destination for international capital, such as um, favorable demographics, um, etc., remain as is. I mean, there's no not much of a change in that. Uh, the basic uh, uh, premise remains, uh, and will continue to be relevant in the post-pandemic period. Uh, the demographic advantage of india continues with over 50% of india uh, indians below 35 years of age uh, this significant um, demogra- demographic dividend is visible in young educated and growing population that could help to sustain economic growth in the long term the growing middle class income population uh, would help to grow total consumption demand in the medium term uh, once these agricultural reforms also uh, start delivering uh, the rural uh, as well as the farm uh, income uh, doubling, which which uh, uh, the government is looking at doubling the farm income by 2022, uh, those also should help uh, in in uh, pushing pushing the demand up. Huge infusion of liquidity and other measures have kept the markets going uh, in these troubled times. When the lockdown was introduced, both the government and regulators declared capital markets as an essential service, so we were able to run the markets. Um, and uh, by by ensuring that relevant people are in the offices and we, we could run the, office, uh, uh, the entire marketplace without any interruption. Regulator has also facilitated uh, trading from home uh, for our broker dealers uh, by relaxing uh, some of the norms around uh, trading activity. Our broker firms, uh, broken firms have adopted to the new normal by enthusiastically going digital to keep the markets going. We've seen a huge uh, ramp up of volumes in cash equity markets uh, during this period. Uh, during the lockdown period, our volumes have gone up by over 45% to about $7.5 billion on a daily average basis. Uh, this is almost um, uh, close to doubling uh, compared to what we were doing just about a couple of years back. Uh, we've added the other important aspect is we've added close to 30 lakh new investors in the last eight months period. These are completely new to the market. Uh, these are, I mean, India. India is a identity market com- uh, as against um, uh, other international markets. So any investor who's investing um, uh, has to register with the exchange first, with giving by giving the PAN number. So we know um, uh, the investor editions. Uh, so that that's uh, been. India has always been a retail market, uh, and that has been our strength. Um, India uh, retail. Uh, I mean, non-institutional, non-proprietary, let's not call retail in the sense of retail. Uh, it includes uh, HNIS and other investors also. Uh, but non-institutional, non-proprietary uh, traders, uh, if you exclude those two variety, um, uh, the rest of the, uh, the retail with HNI used to contribute about 50% um, just before the lockdown. Now that number has gone to almost 60%. Um, the other uh, important and encouraging uh, factor is almost... Um, uh, two thirds of new investors, the 30 lakh number which I've mentioned, uh, two thirds are coming from uh, cities and towns which are beyond top uh, tier one, tier two cities. Uh, the breadth of participation has increased dramatically during this period. It looks like uh, the extension of work from home is invest from home. Uh, this is borne out by the fact that uh, uh, contribution of mobile and internet trading. Uh, during the lockdown period has gone up from about 25% to 37%. So significant chunk of uh, investment is happening uh, using, uh, and basically investors are taking control of their order flow. Uh, they are using mobile and internet uh, uh, and not really technically um, uh, passing an order to the broker. Uh, the, obviously orders go through a brokerage firm, but investors are actually placing those orders and trying to control the order flow. That's a fantastic news. Uh, mobile-based investing has gone uh, up to close to about 25% now. Uh, that's that's really showing that investors are adopting digital. Um, the reason why uh, our brokerage firms have been ad- able to add 30 lakh new investors is because they were able to actually completely digitize their um, uh, onboarding processes. Uh, there's no um, uh, touch involved. So that that's a phenomenal 
change which has happened and uh, that has contributed to the phenomenal increase in numbers. Um, the, this increase is on back of continued uh, flow into money market, money into the mutual funds. Uh, the initial period uh, of, uh, of lockdowns have seen some slowdown, uh, but the numbers are still strong uh, and uh, we are seeing uh, significant uh, investment happening in mutual fund through the mutual fund route using systematic investment uh, plans. The growth in retail participation has been achieved based on sustained campaign of investor awareness, uh, education and empowerment. Um, and which has mentioned about uh, uh, the platform for investor education, which we have collaborated with and uh, Bangalore. Uh, uh, and a significant amount of effort is happening. In fact, during the pandemic period, we have completely moved to digital. Um, we would have been conducted close to over 2,000 uh, 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 investor awareness programs using um, uh, webinars and stuff like that, completely electronic media. Uh, NSE has been um, at the forefront of taking equity markets with investors, both uh, by way of knowledge and technology. And there has been an explosion of activity in fintech space, uh, leading to a series of innovations in parsing available uh, information, uh, analytics, and tools that are empowering investors to take control of their investments and out of flow like never before. So earlier, um, uh, while while significant amount of um, uh, Information was available. Investors were not able to really take uh, benefit of that information because they were overwhelmed in a way by the the kind of information which has which has been uh, uh, reaching them. So that in a way has changed fairly significantly. The fintech uh, revolution in a way it has helped a lot of investors to uh, benefit from the the tools which uh, fintech uh, uh, world has been. Sorry, I'm I'm trying to plug in my a laptop to a power source. Uh, I think I'm running out of. I believe his net network. We lost his network connectivity. Yeah, it's, I, 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 I'll just have a word with him. So. Yeah. That's a challenge for the participants as well. Yes, sir. It's very unfortunate. But you know, while he comes back, let me tell the participants uh, that you know there's a serious concern in India about the trading volume. So, as you know, typically we measure stock turnover ratio to show the extent of trading that happens in stocks. India in 2004 was having a stock turnover ratio in percentage terms uh, about 200%, that means twice the turnover as a percentage of the market cap. Uh, that number has gone down and significantly post 2004. And one of the reasons that is ascribed to this fall is the STT, the Securities Transaction Tax, which was started in 2004. And in 2018, uh, at that time when the STT was introduced, there was no long-term capital gain tax. So government said, okay, there's one tax, but not the second tax. But now in 2018, government reintroduced LTCG without withdrawing the STT. So there's a kind of double taxation and that led to, this is experts are saying, a decline in the stock turnover ratio. Now, what is the impact? So World Bank comes up with an indicator called Financial Development Index, where the India has slipped over the years. And I think the 2018 report shows India is about 58th or so position. And one of the major reasons for the slip is this lower stock turnover ratio. In fact, the stock turnover ratio in that Financial Development Index, FDI, has a weightage of close to 16%, 1.6, if I'm not wrong. One of the major, in, there are so many 20 plus indicators, but stock turnover ratio is major. Just one indicator contributes to about 16% of the total index value. So if you slip in that indicator, your total HDI goes down. And uh, people are saying there are several reasons for this 
lower stock turnover ratio, the declining stock turnover ratio since the introduction of STT. Mm, apart from taxes, there are several other reasons that people say, including the number of the floating stocks. So the floating stock percentage is lesser in India because of promoter holding and so on. Uh, that's one reason. Uh, second reason people say is, you know, too much concentration on few stocks. So of the total volume of trading that happens in the market on any day, uh, the top 100 stocks in NSC will do the maximum trading and rest of the stocks, they hardly trade. But what the World Bank calculates this stock turnover ratio is for the market as a whole. So they take the entire market cap in the denominator and the numerator is the trading volume of the stocks which are traded. So if only 100 stocks are traded, that creates problem because anytime an IPO happens, a new company joins the market, your market cap goes up. So the denominator go up, but there would be no trading in many, many stocks. That's an issue. And, uh, you know, people are grappling with how to improve this indicator because it has an effect on the FDI, meaning not the FDI in the sense of foreign direct investment, but the index. And the policymakers, including the Minister of Finance, is really concerned. And they are trying to take steps. Maybe we can see something in this year's budget. We don't know. Some steps to improve this stock turnover ratio. Some immediate steps, some medium term, some maybe long term steps. So we thought that you know we'll get some light, but there's a problem with the speaker from NSE. And uh, Anish is talking to that person, connectivity issue. Uh, there's a question from Dr. Senthil Kumar. Is there an index measure for the FinTech for blockchain development in India? Uh, I don't know of any such measure, but only thing I can tell you is globally, if you look at the global FinTech market, China is about 70 to 75%. So they are the major player. But strangely enough, India is number two in terms of number of fintech players and the total volume that is being handled. China does a much, much better job. Uh, and you today you saw during Raghu's presentation that what kind of AI and machine learning they, they have gone far ahead. Good or bad, I don't know. But fintech has a lot of pr promise and India is in that sector is doing good. Maybe the second player in the world. Okay, so I think we will not be having a speaker from NSC. He may be having some serious internet issue. Anusha, yeah, you were on mute. I tried contacting him. There is some technical issue from his side, I believe. Mm. Okay. Uh, we can I'll just check. Yeah, we'll wrap it up then. It's already yes, seven. Yes, sir. We can, can do you that. Sir. Whether Professor Ashok yes, sir. He has returned, sir. 